Welcome to the car guys and welcome this week to the mighty Phantom Coupe Rolls Royce. That's right people, I get to drive this beast this week in the beautiful sunshine, it is a bit cold so I'm slightly worried about ice but Damien what can I expect? Unparalleled luxury, oh. comfort, oh. incredible build quality. Oh a smooth ride, oh. the spirit of ecstasy. I expect you to smash your head on the roof line every five minutes. Yes, I will. But overall, I hope you're going to be impressed by what is a very rare and very desirable car. So this week, I'm going to take you through the history of this car. We're going to look all around it, point out all of its unique features. And of course, we're going to show you what it's like to own one of these cars and what it's like to drive. Amazing. Now I admit it, I am a Rolls-Royce fan. There's no real reason for it. My father or grandfather didn't own one. I don't come from money or a stately home. And so I don't have any dewy-eyed lingering memories from my childhood. I'm also not enamored with the litany of celebrity roller owners over the years, mainly because there are some pretty odd characters in there, but also because some of the more high profile owners in recent years are, how can I put this? not the sort that I would ever aspire to be. And yes, I am fully aware that when faced with a Rolls Royce, your average, privately educated, plum-voiced, green-haired social justice protester would most likely blow a gasket. Yet, for some reason, I am attracted to the unassuming majesty of these cars, especially the classic open-topped Corniche, very Josh flag, and the Phantom, specifically the Phantom Coupe that you see here. Never has Henry Royce's maxim, strive for perfection in everything you do, been more true when it comes to the Phantom Coupe. This car is pure James Bond villain. It's menacing, it's imposing, it's solid. Nothing says, get out of my way, more than a Phantom Coupe on the charge. It's also got all the class, presence, and Rolls-Royce design proportions shared with classic Phantoms from the 20s and 30s. I mean, just look at this Phantom II from 1929. It's the same car. I must confess that for me, some of the attraction of owning a Rolls-Royce is being part of a proud history of automotive luxury stretching back to 1906. This Rolls-Royce was the latest in a long line of numerical Phantoms that began with the Phantom I in 1925, the Phantom II in 1929, Phantom III in 1936, IV in 1950, V in 1959 and VI in 1968, and then a long gap until the Phantom VII in 2003, which this coupe is part of. And now, of course, we've also got the Phantom VIII in 2017. It's the car bought by self-made people as well as old money, and it actually changes the way that you drive, but more on that when Jason arrives. The Phantom Coupe began life at the Geneva Motor Show in 2006 as this, the 101 EX Experimental Engineering Study. The body was made of carbon fibre, it had a starlight headliner, and it was a two-door coupe, almost the same size as the Phantom Saloon, which was launched two years previously. The 101 EX was created to showcase the technical and architectural innovation in modern Rolls Royces. And not surprisingly, it was extremely well received, leading to Rolls Royce putting the car into limited production from the summer of 2008, and it was retired in 2012. The Series 2 ran from 2012 to 2016, and then that was that. From then on, it was all about the Wraith, and the Phantom Coupe was no more. In that time, 2,168 coupe and phantom dropheads were launched, but there is no accurate record of how many coupes there were. The majority were dropheads. So enamoured was actor-comedian Rowan Atkinson with the phantom coupe that it starred in his film of the time, Johnny English Reborn. Ah, the Rolls-Royce phantom. Truly the Rolls-Royce of automobile. Only that car featured a V16 engine. Reportedly, this was the engine that was originally considered for the production car. Now let's look at the exterior of this car, and that's pretty hard to do in one go because it's so flipping massive. This is one majestic vehicle, a titanic 2.5 ton Leviathan with an all aluminium space frame chassis that dominates its environment like a T-Rex thundering across Pangaea. 
you may think that I've shrunk in the wash, but I haven't. This is just a bloody enormous car. Look at the size of it. Just standing next to me, it's over my hip level. It's 5.6 meters long, that's over 18 feet and yet it's less than two meters wide, which gives it a regal posture, and it does make it easier to thread down country roads. Every coupe has five coats of paint and lacquer, hand finished, and they were available with nine standard colors. This car is painted in diamond black, but you could have also had English white, new sable, Madeira red, darkest tungsten, midnight blue, woodland green, jubilee silver, or anthracite. Just look at the proportions of this fine looking automobile. That classic long bonnet, gently raked front grille, sloping A-pillar, high waistline, short cabin, large 21 inch diameter wheels, and of course, those rear hinged coach doors closed at the touch of a button. Each has the solidity of the sort of gates you find in canal locks. The rear end of the coupe is a contemporary take on the boat tail, and the body seems to seamlessly flow down the roof line around a traditional rectangular rear screen, and then swoops around the rump. So suicide doors in a car, which is the perfect type of door. Look, ah, oh. and yes, there is an umbrella touch down there. Pop the little button. Here she comes. Look at that, see? Nice little umbrella, because Sir doesn't want to get wet. And there's a reason why they put them in the front wings in these cars, because one, if it's wet, the water will drip straight down a channel neatly onto the road, and the engine will gently warm your umbrella to make sure it's nice and dry for the next time. So here we are at the front of the car. Again, very subtle. We have a nice satin grille, nothing too shiny, nothing too over the top. The headlights, obviously the front of the Phantom, look a bit frowny, little tiny eyes, but that's okay, it's very nice. And then of course, this, the spirit of ecstasy. Now, if you lock the car, then it will disappear all on its own. That is called timing. Now this is an engine. You are looking at a 6.75 litre naturally aspirated V12. And even in this cavernous enclosure, it looks like a barely contained remnant of the industrial revolution. It puts out 453 brake horsepower, that's 460 PS, and that's good enough to propel the Phantom Coupe's 2.5 tonnes to 60 in just 5.6 seconds. And on to a maximum limited speed of 155 miles an hour. It's specifically designed to deliver 75% of its 531 pounds feet of torque, 720 newton meters, at just 1000 RPM. Just what you need for refinement. Walking backwards to the car, it's actually an original Phantom drop head. So this is a convertible Phantom that they've come along and they've stitched a roof on it. They've done a lovely job at the back, smoothing those lines where they've put the welds and the various things, but someone forgot to do the front because we've got this really nasty, horrible seam across the top of the windscreen. Why they couldn't have got rid of that, God only knows. Even though this is a Rolls Royce and you're thinking to yourself, the materials used for this car are the premium materials. There are certain aspects of the car which are not premium. One of them is the petrol filler cap. Listen, can you hear that? That's really quite horrible and plastic and, oh yeah, squeaky and yucky. So uh, we'll just move past that. So uh, Damien, what do we, uh, what do we? <laughs> You're perched up there like a little child. Are you loving it? I am. And what is, what, what, what are you showing us here? Well, this is quite cool actually. So you've got like a split rear tailgate on the Phantom Coupe. You've got the upper bit, which you can pop stuff which into is, if you want. Which is quite odd, I have to say, for a coupe. This is, you know, you expect it on a Range Rover. You don't expect a split tailgate on a Rolls, do you? Yeah, but it's actually quite practical because like if you only need to drop stuff in, you can just use the top bit. the top bit. bit, yeah. But then if you really want to sort of like get four golf clubs in there, which there's space to do. Nice. Then you can push down this bit and it also it creates quite a lovely picnic table. So you can sort of yeah. sit here. This can take 150 kilograms of weight. So Shut two your people, face. Two, two people can get on here. 150? Yeah. And it's perfect because you can have a you can have picnic here and you can just have a little bit, little spot of tiffin on the back of your Phantom Coupe. <laughs> I'm sure that's illegal in most countries. Go on then. You sure? Pop you reckon? Because I've got a sneaky suspicion that the pair of us together are a bit more than 150 kilos. Do you think? <laughs> okay. If it starts to creak, just get the hell off. Oh, okay. How about that? 
The interior of the Phantom Coupe is, to use the MTV Cribs vernacular, where the magic happens. It embodies all those phrases synonymous with Rolls Royces, like hand-built, finest quality, supreme comfort, and of course, beautifully crafted. This car's cabin is exclusively optioned with black piano wood and black leather and splashes of chrome, which makes it both timeless and also like relaxing in Darth Vader's boudoir. The layout in here manages to be both modern and historic, with many of the controls looking like they're found in Phantoms 4 or 5, but with a modern twist and modern manufacture. Case in point, the heating controls, which are a direct homage to early Phantoms. And also, more importantly, you can do it without taking your eyes off the road. The dashboard rises out of the thick lamb's wool carpet like the monolith in 2001. The only screen is to be found behind the revolving clock, like so, but it's very small and displays only the output of that horrific BMW sourced iDrive system. And as a consequence, I never use it. And with the analog clock displayed, you could be forgiven for thinking you were in a car of any era or decade. There really is very little to date this car, and that, I think, adds to its charm. You could be driving around town and have no idea what decade, or indeed century, you were in. And that makes this one special place to be. I love the Jack the Ripper gas lamplight illumination of the dials at night. They are fabulous. The historic font and the layout of the dials themselves, you could be in no other car. And I defy anyone to drive one of these cars and not feel like a gentleman on his way to the naughty Hellfire Club. Music is brought to you via a Lexicon Logic 7 sound system with 15 metal speakers, a 9-channel amplifier and a subwoofer under each seat. Rear passengers get this inviting curved lounge seat, lit by boulevard lighting and reading lights from these charming glass Art Deco lamps. This car doesn't have the vulgar starlight headliner, which to me screams footballer or Kardashian. There's just so much to enjoy in this cabin. Everything is made properly and from quality materials, metal and wood, no plastic. Well, almost no plastic, because actually these little window controls here, can you see those? These are inexplicably plastic and I hate using them. Absolutely hate it. Everything else, tactile, beautiful, this, cheapens the whole experience. Look at how massive the steering wheel is. It's like an old Routemaster bus, but that's to encourage a relaxed driving style. So I kind of understand it and I forgive it. Above the wheel is the drive mode indicator, which displays just three things, drive, neutral, and reverse. A blessed relief from the modern cars with all of their pseudo Formula One tech. The buttons on the steering wheel though, well, they are horrible. Yeah, that's it, they're horrible. They're about as desired as a fly in a prawn cocktail. So what else can I reveal about the interior of this car? Well, you've got some storage, not a lot, and it's all hidden away. You've got a compartment here, and here, so both of those are utterly useless for storing anything at all. And you've also got a secret compartment in the center, which slowly reveals itself. Just obviously here, you've got space for a phone to be connected to the system and somewhere to store. And the front section has the quite beautiful seat controls. The central lower part of the dashboard controls the climate control and the heating and also the heated rear screen. And this middle bit is your radio. So you've got your preset stations and your one big toggle button to turn it on and to do the volume. You've got these fantastic reading lights which gradually illuminate when you press the button. That's fabulous. And also up here you have three very important buttons which unfortunately because the font they're written in is so tiny and because you've always got the glare from the windscreen coming in you can never ever read or ever work out what it is. One of these three buttons opens the boot when you're sat in the cabin. So it's quite an important one but for the life of me, I cannot tell you which one it is. 
The only real traces of BMW in this cockpit come in the form of the digital displays on the dashboard and also the warning bongs that you get. That's pure 7 series folks and it does not cheapen the experience just a little. The centre console here has this slab of polished piano wood in it in this model. The bottom section is for the ashtray, again sumptuous metal, a real pleasure to use. And above it, uh, this is the iDrive control, and on all Phantoms, it very rarely works. It is very often jammed in this position, and you've got to get some kind of credit card or something to flip it out. So there we go, oh, almost, ah, there you go. And you can then access things like satellite navigation and radio and all sorts of other settings within the car. But I would highly advise the Phantom owner to set up everything as you want and then never use it again. Not only do we have this big windscreen and a view down that bonnet, but apart from this pillar here, which let's face it, is pretty big, you can see through this quarter window here, through there and uninterrupted over your shoulder. And that is fantastic when you're joining motorways or carriageways because you've got nothing to get in your way. Your peripheral vision can always sense what traffic's there. And as you look over your shoulder to pull out an uninterrupted view. However, whilst front and side visibility is excellent, rear visibility is terrible. You get a very small slit in the back of the car and because the roof is sloping down, that slit actually looks more down than back. Oh, now watch your head, watch oh your head. God, what the hell? <laughs> Honestly, oh, oh <clears throat> mother. Now this is, hang on, whoa, whoa. I can't. Don't try and don't try and close the door with your with your arm. This is the party piece. Look, there's a button. Hold oh, down right. the button. Oh. Which, which there's two buttons. The, the one on the outside. Hold it. Hold it down. Don't oh, you? hold it down. See. Oh, what this? That's part of the Rolls Royce experience, right there. You can't miss that out. How do I move the seat back? Because uh -huh. you know. I'm yeah. A... So the seat controls are in this centre console. So you oh. press this. Just press it. Press that beautiful button. Oh, that is oh. a oh soft open. Check out that action. What's going on here then? <laughs> Basically, you've got this beautiful metal nodule for controlling the seat. Oh, so oh, so that's not because on a normal car that would be like the mirror. No. This oh, is the seat. Oh, yeah. Oh my God, this is just a, it's just incredible. It's, all this black piano wood. We should remind the viewers. Obviously, this is the first time. You've ever driven it. Uh, right, so okay, we have stop start button over here. Yeah, so you push the key into the into the thing. So I've, I've entered the, oh, yeah. entered the key. That's it, hold foot on the brake and then press the start stop button. There you go. The engine makes more noise than I thought it would. Is that because this is a sporty car? Possibly. I mean, yeah. it is tuned more for the driver rather than the sort of passenger and a chauffeur. So yeah, it's a little, okay. little bit more sporty, a little bit stiffer as well. So 200 miles range, so it's half of the fuel. So the tank on this is what, 75,000 litres? Basically, or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what, at the height of the uh, petrol crisis, which is, which is now what it's going to be called, what, what was it costing to fill this? Do you do, what... 200, 200 pounds. Yes, <laughs> it's, got, it's got roughly the same size <laughs> tanks as Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's a column shifter. You bit, grasp and then it. You, and then you pull it slightly forward and then down into drive. What I've immediately noticed, and I'm quite thankful for, is uh, her lady ship sitting at the front of the bonnet because, I mean, that that could be Spain out there. Yeah, it, it's so bloody enormous. It does uh, give you a nice, it gives you a little target reticle, <laughs> and also it sh does show you vaguely where vaguely the car where the front starts. Of the car is. And I feel like I really need to drive this very gently. It doesn't feel like the car needs to be hustled. No. That's always not a word in its vocabulary. You sit very high, don't you? Yeah. I mean, this is almost Range Rover exactly. kind of height. Because also, when we got in and then turned it on, yeah. it, it went up. Oh, it went up as well? Yeah, yeah. It actually increases in height just to, just to give you an even more commanding view of the peasants. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been actually driven in this car, so don't it's quite you? surreal, really. It's very lovely, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is waft city in here. <laughs> it's very quiet. I think what you're going to notice is it changes the way you drive. It makes you a lot more calm and relaxed. There's no chance of road rage in this car at all. It is all about just 
getting to your destination as stylishly and as regally as possible. You are cocooned in here, aren't you? Away from the nuances of life. Yes. Apparently out there somewhere, mm. there's cost of living crisis. Okay. There's, there's wars. There's sort of baked beans costing a fortune. All these things are outside, out here, but they really, right now, right here and now, they yeah. just don't matter. Well, they don't matter, do they? Those brakes are almost apologetic, aren't they? <laughs> do you know what I mean? They take no effort, but it's not a hard pedal. It's a very soft pedal. Yeah. The last time I drove this road was in the Talba. Yeah, quite that, a contrast. That was a, <laughs> was a slightly different mm. experience. Yeah. So this car's not really, it wasn't built to chauffeur people around. This is for the gentleman driver, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly right. Yeah, the normal Phantom, it's a little, a tiny bit longer, uh, a lot softer. And this one is just slightly keener, slightly stiffer. Responses are slightly improved. There's also, a, I think, a sport button somewhere. Oh, which, really? How crass. Yes, exactly, which could, could firm things up a little bit more. But yeah, very much this is more for the person in the driver's seat. So power reserve, talk to me about power reserve. We don't have a rev counter, nothing so. No, no. Silly as a rev Nothing counter. so gauche. Yes, gauche as yeah. a rev counter. Yeah, what that essentially yeah. does is a, it is another Rolls Royce sort of hallmark signature. What it essentially says is how much engine power, how much power you've got left in reserve. So normally it'll, it'll sit there tickling at about 100% if you're not really putting your foot on the accelerator. Right. And then the more you put on the accelerator, the less power in reserve you have. So it's kind of almost like a reverse rev counter. Oh, okay, I get the idea. So have you ever seen zero? No. No? No, I don't think that exists because the size of this engine, uh, there, is, there is nothing you could do that it means it wouldn't keep at least 20% <laughs> in reserve. <laughs> and you've got to think that the size and the speed that you could attain uh, quite quickly, you're not going to want to push it. No, it and it doesn't encourage you really to be that sort of hooligan. No. I mean, obviously, in the name of science, we will be... Giving it a little bit of beanage. That, we will be doing that. But even in that case, I, I doubt very much whether you'd go below 30%. It's kind of like the Titanic. Very, re very rarely did they rev the nuts off the Titanic. <laughs> Well, they didn't really get a lot of opportunity to do that, did they? Yeah. You know, let's not, can we not, you know, <laughs> bearing in mind the conditions of the road and all of the ice around, compare this to the Titanic? Yeah, I think the Titanic metaphors are probably <laughs> misjudged, aren't they, today? Mm, slightly. I think one of the things I'm really looking forward to is is getting in the back. And obviously, oh, yeah. I don't mean that to sound a bit weird, but <laughs> I mean, I've not, I've not actually, I don't mean that in the old army sense. <laughs> Not a euphemism. <laughs> but I've never I've never been driven in the passenger seat or the back of this car and I'm quite intrigued to see how it feels. So yeah, in a minute we will we'll conduct an experiment and, and I'll get in there and see and tell you exactly what it's like. So I think now you're beginning to understand why this oh. car is in the garage, really. Oh, it just See so what I couldn't understand was why you had a why you bought a Maybach. Yeah. When you had this and and now I know why, because the Maybach's very new money. Exactly. It's a lot more, I don't know, Louis Vuitton man purse. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is this is non-labelled. I bet there is a Louis Vuitton edition of the Maybach as well. Oh, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. It's the difference between flying cattle class and flying first. When you arrive after a first class flight, it doesn't matter how far it is, then generally you don't feel too bad because you've had a nice sleep and you've had some good food and they've trusted you with metal cutlery. The thing that I'm noticing the most is that I could probably do with a head up display. Right. Why is that? It's not very obvious, that speedo, if that makes sense. Well, that massive dial in the middle well, of the yeah, dashboard. Oh, yeah, but it's got very delicate little arm that's poking out and. That's because it, you know, sort, that's the sort of thing gentlemen trust, isn't it? You don't yeah, want some don't big old neon <laughs> dial with a big old stick on it. That's what you get in a Escort RS Cosworth, oh, isn't it? This is, you know, fine bone china. It's almost, I'll tell you what it's like, it's almost that speed limits now don't apply to me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, I think that it's might like, be true. I'm above the law. I think you are. Uh, you know, I'm in a Rolls Royce, seriously. It's like being in a Ferrari or a Lamborghini in Italy, almost. It's yeah. that kind of. You know, they're probably, if I'm considered to be going quite faster than I should, then 
maybe they'll just have a little word in my ear. Yeah, because they'll assume that you'll be a large landowner who has severe influence at the golf club with the chief of police. Exactly. Yeah, there yeah. is that inference, isn't there? There is. Oh, yes. English countryside, Rolls Royce. I mean, life really doesn't get a lot better than this, does it? <laughs> I mean, this is a properly good day out. Oh, we haven't done the beans yet. We haven't done some beans. Goodness me. Do we, we have the opportunity, to, I wonder? We might well, have to wait till we, we get back a, to that open bit and do it when we I'm We would in the have back the opportunity. The However, there is a gentleman behind us in a police car. Really? Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I fear that he may not be too keen on us having the beanage. Five minutes later. So we've swapped, right? We've now swapped. Damien is getting to sit in the back and be chauffeur driven, enjoying it. Do you know what I did notice when you were getting in the back? Yeah. Is that there's mirrors in the C pillar with beautiful kind of 1920s art deco shaped lights. Yes. And that's now, and that kind of now makes sense to me because all of the glowy bits of this car, so all of the light switches, things that glow, so inside yep. the door handles and stuff, are yep. all in that green glass. Yes. 20s exactly. green glass. Exactly. Which is what that is. So I'm loving this car now even more than I loved it before. I know, it's like being in an episode of Poirot. It, yes, it's, it really it's, is. It's proper full-on Agatha Christie spec. I feel like you need a cigarette with one of those really big holders in yes, it. Do you know exactly. what I mean? So those little touches just make this place a visual feast. It's absolutely gorgeous. And one thing I didn't notice is that in the back here, the plate that the controls to open the window, yeah. that's actually sitting on a piece of that green glass. Is it? Yeah. You've got like a grab handle here, which is quite interesting. So I've got something there to hold, hold on, on to, to if you're getting a bit vigorous in the driving. Oh, you've got a couple of nice little speakers back there just to yeah. give you a little extra Yeah, sound. The, the sound system in this car is really good, actually. Yeah. It is exactly like being in first class because it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. Everything yeah. is perfect. Everything you touch oh, yeah, is the, lovely. All the surfaces so are nice. So tactile, yeah. yeah. I've got okay. nice sort of, uh, got my heating and sort of ventilation bits here. That's beautiful. I've got another, presumably some huge thing there. I don't know what that does. How does that open? There's a big slab here that feels like it would open for maybe cup holders. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, that's nice. I'm glad you're enjoying it back there. Oh I, yeah. And I, and I don't want to ruin your enjoyment of the luxury. Yes, yeah. yes. But there is one thing that we haven't done. Ah, are you talking about uh, extreme beanage in my Phantom Coupe? Well, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking well, about. Well, okay, yeah. all right, all right. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm relatively cool with it okay. on, the, on the proviso yeah. that it's, it's a straight, a, a a straight <laughs> clean, dry bit of road if we can. Well, dry, dry may be a little tricky, but yeah. I, I believe we're just about to come up to a nice bit of dual carriageway here. So uh, we're doing about 45, and yep. I'm basically going to nail it. Are you ready? OK, give it okay. a go. Nailed to the floor. Uh, nothing, something. Nothing. Now quite a surge of power. The needle seems to be flying around a lot. Uh, I'm down to, yeah. oh yeah, we hit zero. No, you didn't. Yeah. You hit zero? Uh, yeah, soz. The trouble is, as you well know with me, if you're going to put a challenge out, <laughs> you're never going to hit zero. Oh. I don't know how fast we were going. Let's just say some. Really, we got no instant, like, crazy burst. Oh, no. It basically just increased pace at a very steady and it, quite sufficient yeah. level. I think what the car said was, oh, so you want to go a bit quicker, we'll go a bit quicker. And then it was like, oh, so you've still got your foot yeah. literally planted yeah. to the floor. OK, we'll make a better progress then. Yeah. I, I think what it said in a sort of Jarvis voice was, Sir, sir, uh, there appears to be someone from Essex driving the car. Um, could, could we please sort that out? Oh, you're right. Yes, these ashtrays. Yeah. This is for me, isn't it? Oh, they're yes. so nice. This is a beautiful, beautiful place to be. I thought it was going to be cramped, actually. Mm. But because you've got the sloop, swooping roof line, I think people obviously much taller than me are going to struggle but it doesn't come back as harshly as I expected. I've got more headroom than I thought. The legroom is a little bit tight, but perfectly fine. So I'm not like totally crammed in here. I think right. I would be if I was on your side. But also what's really good about it is that I suspect 
no one has ever sat in the back of here. <laughs> He's definitely a big old lump. I will say that. You oh yeah. Do get. It doesn't shrink around you. It's not one of those cars. <laughs> you know what I mean? It shrinks around you in the same way that I don't know. You know, <laughs> Australia elephant, shrinks yeah. around you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you see on the steering wheel the sport button? Oh, I found it. Good. So you've now. Oh, oh, hello. Oh, well, that's a bit more. Hello. That's a bit more fruity. That's made a difference to the beans quotient. It basically well, it's done uh, holds the, the gears. It holds the gears longer. Yes. Uh, it does that. Uh, it gives you a faster kick down and improved throttle response. Yes. That's what that, it gives you. That that is definitely what it does. It does nothing to the steering. No. Nope. And nothing to the suspension. This is how Alan Sugar feels every day of his life. Every single day. How do you feel about that, captain of industry thing? Do you think it's frowned upon now to be chauffeured around in a Rolls Royce checking on staff morale? I think that's very old school, not very modern, is it? What I noticed, it was quite a strange phenomenon, that, because you, you would think immediately, no, it's offensive. If you're a self-made boss, you've got a big company, and you arrive in a Rolls Royce, you would think people are just going to hate you. Pitchforks, burning torches. Yeah, but what I found in my business was the opposite effect. If I turned up in a normal car, like say I, I got a service and they gave me a hire car and I just turned oh, up in a normal car. A nice micro for instance. Yeah, everyone thought the company was in trouble. <laughs> so it was kind of like a barometer as to how safe their jobs were oh. and how well the company was going. Can I just... Oh, oh, oh. bit of squirm, I a mean, little bit, bit of squirm there. there. I'm sure it? we're going to make this corner. I mean, there's, oh, definitely, yeah. there's definitely not black, potentially black ice there. No, I, I think, <laughs> actually, I'm going to turn that small button off because it's just... Yeah, not it's just fun. not needed. You're either a, a Rolls-Royce person or you're not. There are lots of people that can't imagine anything worse. And of mm. course, you know, thanks to various celebrity owners over the years, that's perhaps <laughs> been amplified. But you can't sort of knock the fact that it's over 100 years old, that history, all of those incredible machines that Rolls-Royce has created over the years, the status symbol, the, the, the way it's woven into the fabric of British society. And, and interestingly, you know my feelings, everybody knows my feelings on car companies that should be left to die. If they can't make it on their own, yep. then they should just be left to die. Oddly, I don't feel that way about Rolls-Royce. Yeah. It is one of those car companies that I think should always be there because it is, what it stands for is something quite special. You know, your Astins of this world and the Lotuses of this world, frankly, I don't care whether they live or die. Mm -hmm. um, like many, many car companies have gone before them, but there is something about this that is very, very special and should always stay special. And on that note... It's time for a it. sausage sandwich. Absolutely. Thank you for watching this episode on the Rolls-Royce Phantom Coupe. Hope you enjoyed it. I absolutely loved it. I feel like Lord of the Manor now. That's it, I'm gonna have to go and purchase one immediately. Nothing is like fit driving a Rolls Royce. It's the best feeling in the world. So if you wanna see more stuff on the channel, don't forget to subscribe, ding that notification bell for when we have another film uploaded. Find us on Instagram and Facebook, not, not Facebook. Facebook, and Twitter, not Twitter. And don't forget the website and don't forget the merch. And there'll be another episode next week.